Usually when you look back on things that you enjoyed at a younger age, some things doesn't age as well as others. If it's not fun, why bother? That video game that you loved plays more poorly than you remembered. That show that you liked is a creepy abomination. But I have an interesting history with entertainment. I hated movies and TV shows growing up. Hated them. I never had the patience or the attention span to make it through a full movie. Now obviously that's different now as my patience and attention span has gotten better with age. So did my appreciation for other people's stories and characters, whether it be in an audio drama, book, video game, or a movie. Stories and characters grab me first and foremost. If a movie doesn't have these two interlocking pieces, most likely it won't be good in my eyes. But there's one series of movies from my childhood that has arguably stood the test of time. A series whose characters are interesting, relatable, and likable. Its stories and ideas are so well done and unique that no other form of media has come close to coming up with it. It's a series that is very special to me. And that series is Hot Wheels. To say I didn't have a complete appreciation for stories at an early age would be ridiculous. I love to read constantly actually, and I would always be getting in trouble for staying up too late just poring over books. Zeth. Uh oh. But one other thing is that I loved making up my own, just in a different form. Toys. And there was one toy line that I just never could let go of. Yep, I was a train kid. Guilty as charged. Trains, though, are what slowly led me into liking different forms of media. For some reason, I liked watching real trains. Slowly going down the track for hours. I don't know. Obviously, I watched the classic Thomas the Tank Engine show. Get that out of here! But I still never had the patience to get through more than a few episodes. There's only a few times that I chose to watch a movie. Back in 2004, when Godzilla Final Wars was releasing on DVD, my dad gave me two choices. Buying that, or a new toy. I chose Godzilla, obviously. Listen, kid. There are two things you don't know about the Earth. One is me, and the other is... Godzilla. But because of my interest in trains and engines and just things that moved, obviously that slowly started to include cars. And one day I actually saw a commercial for a Hot Wheels track set. In the Swamp Realm, <laughs> you have just 30 seconds to defeat the Swamp Beast. This is my swamp. Attack the track with six speed. After seeing that, I couldn't help but ask for it. So I had been pretty good lately, and my father bought it for me and spent hours setting it up. And what did he get? Me scared and running out of the room because the scary green man went <laughs> Puny cars. I was really scared of that. You made me take it apart, take it back to the store, then a day later you made me buy it again and put it back together. <laughs> Hot Wheels started to slowly be used more and more with my trains and because of that my collection grew. They were cheap as dirt though. I have no idea how much they cost now, but back then when I was collecting, you could get two cars for a dollar. And usually they were the whole buy two, get one free, or get a whole pack for free. So what I did was I would always pick one car that looked really cool and one blind bag car. I always thought the mystery car was the cooler one for me. And there was one car that I got that ended up being my favorite. Some orange car with a dragon on it. We'll come back to that. Around this time, however, there was a way to watch movies called VHS, or Video Home System. Instead of... It was more like this.
But with physical media, you could go and rent videotapes at a place called Family Video. Yeah, Weekend at Bernie's too. Now that's an hilarious premise. Not Blockbuster, they were expensive for us. But with Family Video, all kids' movies were free. So if I honestly wanted to rent the same movie over and over and over again, eh, my parents really didn't care. And there was one movie that I rented over and over and over again. Now, I don't recall how I came across this, nor when I first rented it. I just remember that I would always rent it over and over and over again. Now, because I watched this movie so many times, it added even more to my love of Hot Wheels. I collected more cars, I got more track sets. But we never could afford a ton of the more recognizable sets, like the Loop the Loop Dragon or the Trick track sets that a lot seemed to have at the time. I would mostly make my own out of paper plates, other tracks from different sorts of play sets. But when I did get a set, Oh, it was so much fun. For starters, I remember I would always get one of these water changing playsets every once in a while. You would shoot the car into this tank full of water and it would change the car color. There was one that I remember I always had set up too, it was this mega ramp. You'd attach this bad boy to the back of the door and you'd have an elevator to have the car shoot up. The car would zoom down and you'd try to aim for this stupid cardboard cutout. But I just remember having that one set up all the time and it was a lot of fun. But the last big original Hot Wheels set I can honestly remember getting was Monkey Attack. Wow. Try and challenge me with your super fast cars I'll cut you to the floor and I'll trap you in bars Just when you think you're on a roll I'll chew you up and I'll swallow you whole it's gorilla attack, and I'm crushing this town. What's that? A missile? Oh no, I'm going down! This was my favorite set. My dad actually had the special order it online, and it was massive. This one was so cool to me, and it still is kind of. It kind of reminds me of a real Goldberg set. There's all these different pathways that your car could take, not to mention because I was a big kaiju fan, it made the set even better. I always called this the King Kong set when I was little. The only issue with this playset was that we did have to send it off every once in a while for replacement parts because they were faulty. But honestly, that's how I started my collection and my way of getting into Hot Wheels. Everybody's got their own story from their favorite cars to their favorite sets and even their own memories. But let's turn the clock back a little bit to that movie. Highway 35. Eventually, things started to switch over to DVD and family video with it. And Family Video stopped carrying VHS, and with that, my movie. But what made this movie so great to me? It's a children's movie based off a toy line. How could it be good? Three words, story, characters, and creativity. Highway 35 is probably one of the coolest ideas I've ever heard of in a kid's movie. There's robots, cyborgs, alternate dimensions, cars that go over 300 miles per hour, and those cars also have special powers. It's a lot to take in, but trust me. The story behind Highway 35 is that Mattel was gearing up for the 35th anniversary of the Hot Wheels franchise back in 2003. So to celebrate, what better way than to release something special? The Highway 35 line was born. It's the Hot Wheels World Race. Now you can be part of the World Race. Choose from 35 tricked out cars. And if you buy all 35 cars, you can send away to get the World Race Ultimate Track Set free. Plus shipping and handling by mail while supplies last. Batteries not included. See package for details. Go faster. Go to pass ya. Hot Wheels leading the way. Hot Wheels World Race Cars, each sold separately. 35 being a very special number, with the lineup being split into five different teams, the Wave Rippers, Street Breed, Road Beasts, Dune Rats, and Scorchers. Each team was made up of seven different vehicles and their respective driver. So, 35 different cars in total. And what's even more cooler is the outlier. If you counted Z36 as the last car, that's the 36th car. Z36. This series is more smarter than it needs to be. And honestly, this is just so cool. When I was little, I always wondered why specifically the highway was numbered 35. Other than the world race starting specifically at this highway, 
There was no other explanation in the movie. I call the track Highway 35 because that's where it begins. Same goes for the teams. Why 35 racers? Well, it was because of the anniversary of Hot Wheels. This is just an awesome way to tie the lineup to the actual celebration and year. For me, I was never able to collect the official world race cars. I got into the series around 2005, by the time the car series had been long gone, which I'm honestly really sad about because these cars are gorgeous along with every single car being personalized. When I was trying my best to collect Diora 2 models, I didn't collect the Diora 2 car, I collected the Vert Wheeler car. I absolutely love the packaging of these. Compared to a regular Hot Wheels, these have a completely different look. It feels special with the car being displayed almost in this dome-like package. It just feels like it was tailor-made for collectors. As for the cars themselves, I've never had any, nor have I ever seen one in person, but judging from the pictures and the videos, these have a noticeably higher quality than a traditional Hot Wheel. There's so much detail from the logos and the paint. Overall, just extremely high quality. <laughs> Along with every single car though, there are things that were included. Some had VHS tapes, but every single car had a mini comic book, exploring the backstory of that character in the car. This is honestly still one of the best marketing ideas I've ever seen. And it's a shame that not more of it's done. The only other toy line I, I can honestly think about that did this was the Masters of the Universe. This toy comes with something that can really open up a kid's imagination. Its own legend. He-Man! The reason that it's so genius is because it gets kids into the world. It gives you something to latch on to. Instead of it being a generic cool car, now you're more attached to the story behind that car and the character. Plus, if maybe someone didn't like a specific car in the lineup, they would still buy that car because they wanted to see what happens next in the story. Paper bag or triple mylar? Uh, no thanks, I'll just eat it here. The story of the comic books is actually quite decent, but like the Masters of the Universe, the comics are very different from the movies. But it does have its similarities. For starters, all the characters have different designs. You can probably chalk this up to the two being different mediums of storytelling, but that's one. Another is that the cars aren't in separate classes, meaning that they don't have superpowers. They can take a beating like they can in the movie, but there's not one car built for a specific terrain better than another. Galorum looks completely different in the comic book, sprouting more of long blonde hair instead of that silver short white. Probably the biggest change is instead of the world race being won by Vert Wheeler, it was Banji Castile. But other than that, the similarities are mostly the same, just happening a little different than that of the movie. For instance, there's still the greatest challenge, Lonnie gets stuck in lava, the reveal of Z36 being Kurt Wilde. They're similar in events, but are very different than that of the movie. Another thing that I have to point out is that the art of these comics. It reminds me so much of early image comics. So many of these panels look like they were from Spawn or Bone or Invincible. It has a very similar art style. One cool fact about these little comic books is actually that Jeff Gomez had a small creative partner that helped out, Fabian Nieza, who was not only the co-creator of X-Force, but the creator of Deadpool and Shatterstar. Oh, I'm invested. Honestly, the rabbit hole for this just never ends. This is honestly really cool, and it blows my mind, because the comics that he was a part of are really, really good. And it also shows another layer of quality that was added to just the comic books. But honestly, in total, this is not a bad way to celebrate the 35th anniversary of a toy franchise. I think it's better than what they did with their 50th celebration, but that's all their celebration was going to be. A simple new lineup of toys with a comic book included. Then enters a man called Jeff Gomez. Growing up, he had a love of movies and video games like Pong and Speed Racer. He always imagined himself as a storyteller and a creator. So when he went to college, he went to school for studying writing and film production. A little bit after this though, he found himself working for a little comic book company called Valiant Comic Books, or you might know him as Acclaim. He worked as a writer and an editor, having a massive success in the 1990s, working on Magic the Gathering and also creating Turok and Turok 2. 
Having those being massive hits in their medium, Jeff decided to leave Valiant and form his own company, Starlight Runner Entertainment. While he was at Valiant Comics though, working on Magic the Gathering, one other thing that contributed to his massive success with Turok and Magic was that Jeff Gomez was a supporter for expressing a world in different forms of media. For instance, with Magic the Gathering, the video game that he produced was a sequel to the comic books. And once you wanted to know more about the world that he created, there was additional lore available on the internet. Remember, this is the 1990s. Nothing like this had ever been done before. And people loved this. Now we enter his boss, Amy Smith Bolin, who was his boss at Acclaim Entertainment. She left to go work for Mattel as the big boss of Hot Wheels. She remembered what Jeff did with Turok and Magic, and out of the blue, she just called him up and said, Hey, can you do for Hot Wheels what you did for Turok and Magic the Gathering? Having been a massive fan of Hot Wheels growing up, Jeff jumped at this opportunity. Now Jeff, he had plans. Big plans. But remember, all Mattel wanted to do was a simple comic strip, along with their toys. Now as he was describing his story about the world race for the comic book, he mentioned how it would be perfect for animation. But here's the problem with that. Animation, it ain't cheap. And that's one thing that Mattel had a problem with. But Jeff had an idea. From working in the video games industry, he had a plan for that. He suggested using the assets from Mainframe's Barbie movies, and that he would build a world for Hot Wheels from the worlds presented in those movies. Just to set the record straight, I do wash my clothes. This is insane, and also genius at the same time. Not only does it explain why the worlds are a bit generic in the first movie, you have the lava, the jungle, ice, but it repurposed the assets, making it cost-effective for Mattel. But remember, they did not plan this. All they wanted was the comic book. But with everything to gain and nothing to lose, Mattel said yes to Jeff Gomez. So Jeff Gomez is the father and the creator of Highway 35, its stories, and its characters. But when it comes to the characters of Highway 35, it's actually a pretty interesting story. In an interview with JC Squared, when asked about the representation of different races and females, Jeff Gomez responded saying this. These characters are from all over the world, and that's what we tried to communicate. This is a worldwide franchise, and you want to see that reflected in the world. At the time, this was understandable, and Mattel got it. Remember, 9-11 was just a few months before all this. It was still fresh in people's minds. So the only character that Jeff said they were nervous about was Kadeem. But Jeff responded by saying this. I said it's so important for, uh, for young people in the, the Middle East to see themselves in, in this race and, and to, to see themselves as, as good natured, good human beings who are competent and who can, you know, win, win one of the races and, and, and so forth. This is honestly really cool, and it shows a lot about Jeff as a person. But now we turn our attention to the female representation. With the female characters like Lonnie, Mattel was like, that's never been done before. And they're right. When you think about it, with a lot of boys' toy franchises, if there's a female character, it's usually the only one, or there's either a good one and a bad one. I usually think back to Thundercats, He-Man, Ninja Turtles, so they were right. It's never been done before this way. This is a boy's property. But after a long push and pull, Mattel finally agreed to it. Which honestly, I never minded as a kid. The female characters were just as cool as the male ones. The diversity in this movie never felt out of place like it does a lot of the times nowadays in movies. It's a world race. So that explains why there's so many different races and genders. And it never really pauses on this. They're just characters, each one with their own background and story. So it's never distracting in the final film. But that begs the question, why was this so good? Because it's awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> Woo 
The idea behind making an animated show or a movie behind a toy line has always had mixed results. Sometimes they can be extremely good and iconic. He-Man! But they always feel cheap at times. Take He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. The animation is just not the best. They reuse a lot of animation. And while the show's awesome, its quality can vary. Thundercats was okay, but I never was really a fan of it. Lego has always had very cheap animation, and their movies have never really been good in my opinion. The Lego movie is in a different catalog. Same goes for something like Transformers. I'm a massive G1 fan, but that original series can be rough to watch at times. So when it comes to shows based on a toy line, the results can be mixed, and most of the time, they find it difficult to incorporate what made the toys so cool for kids. Very rarely, a show nails it and hits it on the head exactly. But when a show does nail that, and what made the toys special from the start, it adds so much more love to the toy line. Highway 35 nailed this in every aspect. Hot Wheels when I was a kid meant fast cars and crazy tracks. With those two in mind, I could make up the rest. Who my drivers were, car names, track names, you name it. The rest was up for free game. Highway 35 made me love Hot Wheels more because it nails this. There's super fast cars. You're able to feel the power of them. When a shot like this happens, that is how it would play out in my head as a kid. Same goes for the 300 mile per hour thing. Come on, who didn't do this as a kid? Also, if you had any track sets growing up, you would know that they had these little booster parts that would launch the car through the whole track. These are actually in the movie too. It's a small detail that is just taken from the toys. Same thing goes for the tracks in the show. They're mostly orange, but there's other colors like purple. This was because Hot Wheel tracks were always orange. Sometimes they were other colors, but mostly they were orange. Like the boosters, it's just another detail taken from the toys, and it's incorporated in a way that's not distracting. I mean, the people behind this just knew how to make Hot Wheels look cool. Like I said also, one thing that I loved with Hot Wheels was crazy tracks. And while this one maybe doesn't have the craziest ones, it has some really cool ones. The first race has this skyscraper loop while the race goes through a volcano at the end. The second race is more of this cliffside racing with crazy loops and a big jump. The third race, while not being my favorite, there's this awesome part where the racers have to drive up this dinosaur's tail and jump out the mouth. While the last race is just this typical Antarctica place, ending in this awesome Hot Wheels city with all sorts of tracks and loops. And there's even the shark from all those shark bite playsets. While it's pretty cookie cutter as in terms of it's a lava place, it's a jungle, it's an ice and snow area, they still take full advantage of all the hazards that those ones would present. One person gets stuck in lava. Some don't make specific jumps or loops. They're all just extremely well done. I guess the only thing that is a little unfair is that each team has special powers integrated into their cars. While this is cool, some cars have it way better equipped than others. Let me explain. The Wave Rippers have these turbo jets on the bottom of their car so that they can launch and hover around. Scorchers, they can protect themselves with this cow catcher and metal wheels and they can drive through lava or bash solid metal. Dune Rats, they can only change their tires into spikes but they can drive through very thick terrain. Street Breed, they have this stupid camera that can show the best direction of driving. And finally, the road beasts who have a chainsaw. See where I'm going with this? While in the movie, it's still all about your skill as a driver and utilizing those skills, you can see how some have it better than others. My favorite was always the Wave Ripper cars and the Scorchers. The Diora 2 and the Stingray being always my favorite. But for as cool as the cars are, their drivers are just as memorable. Our main character personifies what we thought was cool in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Radical! Vert Wheeler. He's a 16-year-old surfer and a skateboarder. Oh, also, he's a really good driver. I'm going to be the best driver in the world. You made a perfect score on the written test and the driving test. Vert Wheeler. 
While he was my favorite when I was younger, I do think that as I've gotten older, he's a lot more interesting later on in the series. Here, he's just kind of the average cocky teenager that nobody really likes at first until he's thrust into a situation where he's forced to make a change. It's not the worst, and it's actually handled really well. Throughout it, he slowly learns to be a team player and a leader. It's not deep, but it's executed very well. Same goes for a lot of the other characters, but here I find them a lot more likable and interesting than Vert. All of the main players here have interesting and likable backstories and reasons for participating in the race. While Vert just wants to prove that he's the best of the best and that changes slowly, I think that the person that's the most interesting is Kadeem. Kadeem enters the race for an unselfish reason. See, it's revealed later in the movie that his reason is that he wants to help his village. He comes from a poor area, so the reward money would be of use and help him out. And he wants to use that to help his people. I want to win, yes, but not just for myself, to get the money our people need. But what's so cool is that this arc interlocks with Vert's, where Vert learns to become less selfish because of Kadeem. Huh. Funny, I, uh, I never thought about what winning means to other people. Just what it means to me. I absolutely love this in stories when characters can have an effect on each other. And out of all the things that it's done well in, it's a Hot Wheels movie. More characters like Banji and Taro, they don't necessarily have a complete arc, but they're cool and they're interesting. I never get tired of this. I'm gonna pass. There's plenty of time that the movie focuses on the main drivers, mostly because the tracks are designed where that each one throws one of the drivers into the spotlight. Like with the ice track where Marky and Vert are more the main character, or the desert track with Kadeem. It's pretty cool that a toy tie-in cartoon was able to make such likable characters right out of the gate. Open the gates! One of my favorites is Kurt Wilde. Now I'm gonna be honest, this is one of the worst twists of all time. You see it coming so fast that it's distracting. But he is still an interesting character. His relationship with his brother, for example, with how he may show no remorse for his brother, but underneath he still cares for. And this is taken and explored even more so in the next series to come. Probably the best character in the entire series is Dr. Tesla. He's always mysterious, conveying only what he wants his drivers to know, whether it be that to their benefit or their detriment. But he's also shown the care about his drivers. But it always seems like he's a man that's haunted by his own ambition and that he cares about the goal in the long run more so. Which, speaking of the goal, the ideas and the story that World Race tells is so cool. Basically, Dr. Tesla is after an all-powerful item called the Wheel of Power. And while he's trying to send in the fastest car, it's not all about speed in these tracks. So that's why he recruits drivers from all around the world for this. Drivers with unique skills have been recruited from all over the world. With a massive prize pool of $5 million for whoever retrieves the Wheel of Power. Honestly, it's simple enough where I never was confused as a kid, but it's still interesting enough for an adult. What exactly is the Wheel of Power? Some questions aren't answered entirely until the sequel series, like the topics of the Accelerons or Dr. Tesla's past or even the Wheel of Power itself. But once they are, it is fantastic and all the puzzle pieces link in with each other. For instance, the Wheel of Power being another portal that drivers can go in for even more challenging races is an amazing idea. Dr. Tesla being almost a rogue researcher that was a part of a bigger corporation that later is a villain team. I mean, the ideas that Jeff Gomez was able to dream up, he was totally right about it working in animation. The guy was a genius, and it went even beyond this show. Back in the 70s, there was an original Hot Wheels TV show, for example. Hot Wheels! Hot Wheels! Always chasing, always racing. Hot Wheels! Hot Wheels! This show is an absolute blast to go back to and includes a ton of famous voices like Albert Brooks and Casey Kasem. They're the original voice of Shaggy, and you have Marlin from Finding Nemo. Check out my pecs, little man! <laughs> But what Jeff saw was an opportunity with this show. The main character in this show is a high schooler named Jack Rabbit Wheeler. 
This character is supposed to be the grandfather of Vert Wheeler. It was confirmed by Gomez himself. There's Jack from the comics and, and the original uh, animated uh, show uh, yes. in the 60s. He's uh, Vert's grandpa. This is so cool to see an older show tied into a newer one in a very subtle way. I highly recommend that you go check out the show for yourself. Other ways that Gomez had the brand expand was through a video game tie-in. The Highway 35 game was released on PS2, GameCube, and Game Boy Advance at the time. Now, I never got it, and I never played it, but judging by the gameplay, it takes a lot of liberties, and that's really no problem for me, just as long as it controls well and the gameplay is fun. And the graphics, they look great. They have that cartoony flair that the movie had. Overall, it doesn't look that bad. I'll probably pick up a copy in the future. There was another video game, in fact, too. It was a PC online multiplayer game called Planet Hot Wheels. You have been chosen to take part in the world race. Log on to planethotwheels.com to pick your team, select your driver, and get ready to race against other players live. Some are experienced drivers, while others have talents that have not yet been discovered. I am looking for the greatest driver in the world. If that's you, join the race at planethotwheels.com. Codes available in World Race Episode 2 videos and in unmarked random World Race packages. There was a lot of ties here to World Race. In this, you could race your friends and people online and tracks inspired by the movie. And honestly, I think this is just so cool to see footage from this. I always find it fascinating with early online video games. And this is pretty cool. But sadly, its servers were shut down in 2004. You know, going through all the different ways that Mattel was willing to celebrate 35 years of Hot Wheels, it's a lot of fun from just how experimental they got to taking a huge chance on a movie. It's honestly refreshing compared to nowadays with brands. But now after all the work that was done with Mattel and Highway 35, Jeff Gomez took all of his ideas and wanted to pitch an original intellectual property for the big head honcho, Disney. Basically what he wanted to do was do the exact same thing like he did with Hot Wheels, but with a different property. With the Highway 35 line making big bucks, over $600 million, Disney was intrigued, and they asked him, could you do the same thing, but with Pirates of the Caribbean? So Hot Wheels was influencing Disney, and you could say that it still has today. Disney loves its big franchises in Star Wars and Marvel. You could connect that all the way back to a simple idea to produce an animated movie about Hot Wheels. After the big success though that was Hot Wheels World Race, Mattel seemed to move on. But little did we know, Highway 35 was only the beginning. Usually sequels are just not as good. Let's all be honest here. Sequels are usually bogged down by the go big or go home thought. Bigger action, bigger story, and more characters. These can be a detriment to a movie if not thought out properly. Think about movies like Tron Legacy, Cars 2, Quantum of Solace, Revenge of the Fallen. All of these took great or okay movies and said, yeah, let's mess them up. I can't stand it when sequels do this incorrectly. But here's the kicker. Acceleracers did this, but executed it perfectly. The story begins after Mattel saw an opportunity. The Highway 35 line was a success and the cartoon was doing very well. They decided to continue the story, just without Gomez. The most that he was involved in was making suggestions and reviewing material. He and his team were thrilled with it happening, they were just disappointed that they weren't all creatively involved more. But some people did return. Our directing duo Andrew Duncan and William Law, they were mostly here breaking up directing duties. Mark Edens, who helped on the script for World Race, was back writing all four movies this time. This helped keep a consistent story and great character arcs throughout all four movies. Development for the movies began around February of 2004, with some of the early names being suggested like XL Racers or Realm Racers. 
They were being thrown around before finally settling on Acceleracers. The name Acceleracers seems to be a mix of both the MacGuffin items, the Accelerachargers, and just Racer. Acceleracers. Going from World Race to Acceleracers is a massive difference. For one, Acceleracers is much more darker and far more aimed at older kids rather than World Race, which was aimed at a younger audience. So much so, it even surprised Jeff Gomez, who stated, I was as shocked as anyone by some of the redesigns and Acceleracers. Mattel seriously wanted to age up the characters to appeal to a somewhat older audience. I have to admit, it took a while for some of them to grow on me, especially Taro. While it is still for children, a lot of the character arcs and themes are adult. Some are about forgiveness and death, others about your own personal shortcomings and failures. It's not the deepest at times, but it's executed so well that even someone like my dad could get invested into this world and its characters. Speaking of the characters, in the world, two years go by in between the story of Highway 35 and Acceleracers. So while there's plenty of new faces, the returning ones from World Race are aged up here and have changed dramatically. Speaking of changes, instead of a bajillion different teams like with World Race, it's simplified here to two street teams, the Teku and the Metal Maniacs. Both are extremely distinct and separate. The Teku are more of this high-tech slick cars with big speakers on them, and the Metal Maniacs are more of this junkyard muscle car that looked like it was put together by themselves. Acceleracers, like Highway 35, spawned its own line of die-cast cars. These are not presented in a collectible way like the Highway 35 ones, but the cars are just as cool and detailed. Now remember, I had the Swamp Realm track set, as well as that orange dragon car, but I had no idea at the time that it came from a cartoon or that Highway 35 even had a sequel series. The way that I found out is that my mother would constantly go to the library and grab me things if she thought I would like it. One day, she brought me back a new Hot Wheels DVD called Breaking Point. Now looking at it, there's no indication that this is a sequel or has any ties to Highway 35. So you can imagine my surprise when the first shot is this. I don't know what's happening to me. I won the world race. I'm supposed to be the best. Wait, what? Whoa, 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 wait, 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 pause, pause, pause. I was never more confused or excited by starting a movie. They also have all these brief flashbacks and it showed this. I couldn't make it to the end of the swamp realm. Wait, my swamp tracks in this? The amount of questions that I had and as the movie went on, I was hooked. Here's the bad thing though. Sometimes at a library, they don't have what you're looking for. So instead of watching all four movies in order, I had to wait for whichever one came in next. I ended up watching Breaking Point first, The Speed of Silence next, then The Ultimate Race, and finally Ignition. With me renting them out so many times at the library, my parents actually bought me this sweet four disc box set. Now I could rewatch them to my heart's content. And because of that, I was able to show my friends and my cousins the series, and they even got into it as well. Acceleracers is one of those series where the story and characters are so good, people forget you're showing them a toy tie-in product. Now because I had my own copies, I could explore as much of the extras as I liked. They had all sorts of trailers, obviously, but there was four things that always kept me coming back. They had this virtual garage sort of speak thing where you would get extra information on the characters, the cars, Synchro, with a 500 horsepower twin turbo rotary engine and carbon fiber racing brakes, this car starts fast and stops on a dime. I would just pour over these, reading up on them, making sure that I could prove I was the biggest fan of Acceleracers. They also had these quote unquote games where you would answer a select question about the movie or a tidbit about cars, and then you would help the driver throughout the track. The next is a commercial for a card game that they had. Remember how Highway 35 had a comic book included? Well, with Acceleracers, it was a card game that they had. It had its own rules, and in this video, it's explained in a very fun way. What is that? 
It's an Excella Charger, the most powerful card in the game. Excella Chargers can be played on any vehicle, and they can't be destroyed by hazards. The monkey's using his last three action points to play it. This is it! The Hot Wheels Acceleracer's collectible card game. Get in the race. It's not too complex, but it's just deep enough where you could definitely get into it. But I was never able to get into the card game because I never actually bought the cars. I had them, but I never bought them brand new. A friend of mine gave them to me. I went over to his house one day for a party and I couldn't really care less about the adults talking. So I went into the basement. There, all my friends, they were playing video games, and I liked Mario at this point, or Twisted Metal, but not NBA 2K Live whatever. So out of boredom, I saw his bin in the corner full of trick track sets and other Hot Wheels. And as I pulled out cars, I noticed one in the bottom that looked familiar. It was a Metal Maniac car. I started to tear through that bin, seeing if there was any more, and oh boy, I found almost every single car. From the Teku to the drones to the silencers, they were all here. That whole entire night, I was playing with those cars. And actually, the kid who owned this collection walked up to me and just said, Oh yeah, you can have them if you want. That was honestly so nice and cool of him, and I'll never forget that. The bad thing is, after a few moves and after a few years, I no longer know where any of them went, really. But I had them. Finally, the last thing on the extras was the shorts. Just like Highway 35, Acceleracers debuted on TV first before DVD. While they played out the movies, in order to tease the next episode, they would play these shorts. The only bad thing is, is these are almost integral to the story. Things happen in these that would affect the movies. For instance, in one short, they steal a tire that helps them make switchable tire treads. The bad thing is, is that while it's mentioned in the movie, you kind of need to watch the shorts for it to make sense. Not the biggest deal, but it is weird that they couldn't have been edited into the movies on the DVD, rather than just in extras features. Now at this time, because my love for video games were growing at the exact same time, I began to get Hot Wheels video games. I didn't have the Highway 35 game, but I remember one night, I actually went to the mall with my mom. And there, she got me's Hot Wheels Stunt Track Challenge on the Game Boy Advance. This game was fun to me, but looking at it now, it runs like trash. And it was extremely hard to play for me as a kid. I never got past the first track, to be honest. Playing it now, it's not too hard, but it still runs at two frames a second. Later on, I got another Hot Wheels game on the Wii. Hot Wheels Beat That. This is what I was looking for in a Hot Wheels game. It's not full-size cars, it's exactly like the toys instead, racing around real-world places. The soundtrack is excellent too, with a hard rock vibe throughout. There's actually a lot of Acceleracers cars here, so that made it even more fun to me. Acceleracers also appears in the actual game. 
with its DVD box placed throughout as blockers. I always thought it was so cool to see something that I personally owned appearing in a video game. Playing it now though, its motion controls on the Wii version are way too loose, and it hasn't aged that great. Luckily, there's other versions on the 360 and the PlayStation 2. Because though, I had so much fun with these games, it made me want to watch the movies more and more. But unlike Highway 35, I watched Acceleracers just as much. Acceleracers took everything Highway 35 started and ran with it. Stories, characters, and animation are elevated here by a lot. Before, characters seemed almost one-dimensional in Highway 35. It did the job, but I never watched it for the characters, mostly the amazing races. In Acceleracers, I would not only watch it for the over-the-top car scenes, but I would also watch it for the cool, interesting characters. Give me a wrench, monkey. <laughs> a monkey wrench. Like I said, there's new characters on top of returning ones. Old characters like Marky and Kurt continue their story off of Highway 35. In this, after a deal went south, Marky was put in prison and changed dramatically. He consistently blames Kurt and wants to prove that he's better than him and is not worthless to his team. This isn't solved in one movie though, it's something that's consistently changing throughout all four movies, and it's done extremely well. Kurt, on the other hand, while having to deal with his brother, also has to deal with his turn that happened in the world race, and trying to show that he can be a trusted individual. And if something does go wrong, we'll be in it together. This is what you call character development. Vert here returns and is struggling with winning the world race. He has proven himself as a competent leader, but others refuse to see that. Throughout it, he struggles to live up to being the world's best driver. He consistently makes mistakes throughout and it dissolves his confidence more and more. He sees himself as a liability instead of being a helpful member of the Teku. Sometimes you beat the drones and win Excella chargers but not because of me. Porkchop at first seems like he's the biggest and the baddest out of the Metal Maniacs, with his only soft spot being for his best friend, Mitchell. Hey, the name's Monkey. But you slowly start to see his character more. You learn that he's afraid of water because... My daddy, see, uh, he, he drowned when I was a little boy. It's not the deepest, but it still makes for an interesting character. Probably my favorite arc is between the two new characters, Nolo and Torque. Both have a deep cemented hatred for each other, but it's not for a stupid reason. They're both the leaders of their respective teams, so this explains the rivalry between the Teku and the Metal Maniacs. Originally, Nolo had an older brother that died in a race against Torque. Nolo blames Torque throughout the entire series for this, lying to himself mostly about who was to really blame. And in turn, while Torque knows it's not his fault, he starts to question and doubt himself. Like I said, this isn't something brought up and sorted out in one go. All of these are stretched out across all four movies with it being the cataclyst to the majority of the conflict. The characters here are definitely not the deepest, but for a children's movie, for a children's property that's based off a toy, this is incredibly well done and executed. There's a mature layer here that may be easily brushed aside because of the property or even the animation. Which, let's talk about the animation. In my opinion, it's better and it's worse. It's better from the characters in the movement in the facial animation. World Race had some decent character animation, but here in Acceleracers, it's improved in my opinion a lot. Here's where we get into the bad. I think its car scenes haven't really improved that much. While in total, it's an improvement in some aspects. The new worlds and the tracks have cooler environments and lighting. Cars here have more detail on the models. But in motion, the cars seem stiff. While in World Race, cars had a lot more of a realistic style when they were driven. In Acceleracers, it has realistic style at times, but sometimes it looks worse in my opinion. I don't know exactly how to describe it. But you might be saying, okay, Zeth, but what about the story? <coughs> it's a pretty good story. Acceleracers takes a ton of the concepts and the stories from World Race and expands upon them dramatically. 
a lot of the points from World Race, like the Wheel of Power, Glorum, Dr. Tesla, and the Accelerons, they're explained more here. First of all, the Accelerons. They were this one sentence thing in World Race that was easily brushed aside. It was built eons ago by technologically advanced beings, perhaps from another world. Beings whom I call the Accelerons. They were the ones who built Highway 35, but that's it. Here, they're explained and elaborated more on, but it's still mysterious enough where you're not given all the information. There are these weird aliens once you do see one, and their purpose is explained. It's not stupid. Speaking of having a purpose, the races. In World Race, when a race was won, it was more so to see who's just the best, and to explore uncharted territory of Highway 35. There never was really a reason besides, hey, maybe the wheel will show up at the end of this track, maybe. In Acceleracers, there's a massive reason to win every single race. First of all, all the tracks are incredibly difficult and hard. So in every race, if someone was to be the winner, they would obtain the MacGuffin item, an Accela Charger. An Accela Charger gives the user special abilities depending on the track that they won from. So for instance, the Storm Realm grants the Storm Accela Charger, and once it's activated, it can protect that car from lightning hits. Same goes for all the others. Each realm has its own unique Accela Charger that grants its own unique ability. So not only would you want to win them to guarantee some help on the next unexplored world, but the other reason is to keep them out of reach of Galorum. Galorum in Highway 35 was your typical villain, but she was revealed to be a cyborg at the end. Not really the coolest thing in the world, but here in this series, she's a full-blown Terminator. She has her own army of drivers this time that she sends in to get the Accela Chargers. So hence, all the more reason for the Teku and the Metal Maniacs to win the races. If Galorum was to get all the Accela Chargers, she would rule the world. I like this because it just adds purpose to the races. You couldn't take them out of this series. It raises the stakes and it just makes things more interesting, especially the Accela Chargers. Just seeing what each power was granted and how it happens was just so cool when I was a kid. The environments in Acceleracers are amazing. They have some really good details, in fact, in specific realms. For instance, you have the murky detail in the swamp realm or the dark to the colorful conditions of the water realm. They definitely upgraded the ideas here. There's no two environments that feel similar, kinda like they did in Highway 35. We go from water to city to the death-defying cliffside. There's just so many cool ideas getting thrown here. And because of that, they take full advantage of the environment. For instance, the swamp realm, the tracks are layered with this slippery vine. It makes the driver have to choose the best terrain. And here's what I think the coolest thing in Acceleracers is. Each race teaches a lesson. You're not told this until a little ways through, but it makes sense. The Accelerons, the aliens, they wanted to form the ultimate driver, basically. Highway 35 was just a taste of skill and a starting point, while Acceleracers is the midpoint and the conclusion. For instance, the Lava Realm is about how the track affects your tires. The Junk Realm, it's about how testing the ability to hit the apex of a turn. Yeah! Hit the apex! The Cliffside Realm is about drifting. The Storm Realm is about testing the ability to avoid distractions and focus on the track. It's pretty cool to see actual racing terms and strategies being used. And there's a ton more. All to culminate in the ultimate race. A race focusing on testing every single skill learned by the driver to see whether they're worthy or not of racing the Accelerons themselves. I've just always found this super cool, and it just adds another layer to the races that makes you go, Oh. A lot of the development and concept art of this has been saved, luckily. You can go check out early designs for characters, realms, and designs. They're all very different here, actually. A lot of these date back to 2004. I've always found it so cool to see just how different one of your favorite shows was in early development. If you're a fan, definitely look them up. But let's get back to those tracks. After watching all these movies, however, it started to affect my way of playing with Hot Wheels itself. 
Of course, I would make up my own stories before this with Hot Wheels, but now I was making up my own stories with Acceleracers, Realms, Accelercharges, and Tracks. I remember I would jam my King Kong set with my Swamp Realm track and others that I would have to form this mammoth track. I would take other household items like paper plates and toilet paper rolls to form even crazier tracks. Acceleracers was just everything that, if you were a kid and you liked Hot Wheels, this entire series was designed for you with the love and the care that you felt for your own personal car collection. It's something that I can't really describe well. It was just done very well. But it wasn't just kids that could enjoy the show. Adults do too. And while you might be saying I got my nostalgia goggles on, take it from someone who definitely wouldn't. I think for me, the reason why I enjoyed the series is first of all, it was the first like little kid show that I had seen that had a pretty unique storyline. So the storyline was pretty, pretty big. You know, you had kind of like the Fast and the Furious families in there. So you had the cars with all the neat designs and tools. You had the weird tracks. You had these anomalies that would pop up all over the place. And even though the characters might not know exactly why they're trying to win these, you know, these, uh, what are those things called? The yeah, the Acceler Chargers. Um you still had someone behind manipulating them all. So there was a lot of storyline, like a Star Wars or, you know, there's just a big, huge storyline. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I liked how they did the characters. A lot of times when you have a cartoon, it's the exact same type of thing. You'll have a stupid character, you'll have a smart character, you'll have, you know, the cool character. And they did that to a certain aspect, but they all had, you know parts in them that were really good so even monkey and meatloaf or what was that guy called pork chop so even those two guys for instance you know yeah they were kind of like your comedy duo but they were still good at driving cars and they would r win races so even kind of like your goofball still added to the plot they just weren't there to make another stupid voice like in a lot of your cartoons for little kids and it was just kind of neat. There was, you know, there was even some emotional storylines in there. And although you're not going to cry for a cartoon, I could see how you could take this type of movie, if you do it right, and you have kind of like a, you know, a futuristic take to it, but you kept it similar, and you could make a live-action film. I, I think that you had the storylines. You know, a lot of times when you take a little kid movie and you turn it into adult themed, you have to really change a lot of the storylines. But here it's got all the plots, all the characters, all their backstories, all their cars, all their specialties. Another thing I thought was cool is sometimes they force um, things into movies, like diversity, for instance. But this one made total sense because they had to pick people from all over the world. So when you see people from all different backgrounds, it, it just makes sense. So you don't even think twice about it. Again, I think that would be a positive if they ever made a live action. You wouldn't have anybody griping one way or the other because that's just part of the original storyline from 20 years ago. And I think the last thing I liked is it, it was fun. So even though you had all this kind of like a dark storyline, it still was made for kids. It was really fun, great tracks great you know car scenes the bad guys were robots and no one ever got hurt that was kind of fun how does this for you compare to like masters of the universe and thundercats because i know that you liked those a lot growing up let's say hot wheels is a lot different because hot wheels have been around for i don't even know when but before i was born and they've always had little tiny cartoons, like the Hanna-Barbera cartoon and, and things like that, but nothing big. Where He-Man and Thundercats, they wanted to come out with a toy line and to help celebrate or to promote it, they came out with a cartoon. So that was basically a big commercial to buy the toy line. And it was cool, because they were all these weird characters and, and that's what I enjoyed is just 
science fiction or fantasy character. So I never got into the cars. So I think the difference is you already had a toy line in place for decades. And then what they did is they took that toy line and they were able to make a good story almost kind of like the old movie uh battleship you know they had this game that was lasting for you know when my dad's dad played it back in the 40s or 50s whenever it first came out and they took that and they made a movie about battleships fighting aliens and it was kind of neat but you could see how much they had to change with that and that's kind of how you know, this is with the accelerators is they already had the cars. You already had all these different cars. So they had to actually make a whole new mythos, which the other cartoons that you mentioned, like He-Man and, and Thundercats, they created the cartoon to help sell the figures. So I just think they did a really good job coming up with a story about cars. And, and one thing that you could even look at is they did a good job before there was the Fast and the Furious, before they made Speed Racer, the movie, you know, the live action movie. They did all these things before any of that was there. And even though their budget wasn't big, the graphics, you know, nowadays they look a little dated, but they still look really good because they're all played out a certain way. They all have like a theme. So even though they're a little outdated, they still look really good. Do you remember like the first memory with it or like me introducing it to you? Like how did this even come about where you started watching the show? I remember the first one was, was it Route 35 or what is it? Yeah, Route 35. Route? Highway 35. Yeah, Highway 35. So that cartoon we got at the library, which you would always go and rent. And for some reason, as a little kid, you hated watching TV. You just like playing with cars and trains and making train tracks. So we found this you know, we'd get Candyland, the movie. You love that one. You got this one. And for some reason, once you got a movie, if there was something about it that you liked, you would just rent it every single time we'd go. And this is one of those movies. And so, you know, the first time you put it in, you're busy doing something because we never watched TV back then, hardly. And then finally, you started building these elaborate tracks and you'd get you know your hot wheels set out and you'd you'd turn the tracks or bend the things or you'd get toilet paper rolls and you'd set up these jumps and boxes and and i was wondering where you got all these neat ideas and so i was watching it one day with you and it was kind of a weird you know they're going through swamp land or whatever and all these cool jumps and tracks and i thought that's kind of cool and I don't remember how we found the series after that, the four or five movies after that, but I got into it right away as soon as we started watching it. And so what I thought was really neat is um, I think it helped you growing up because you didn't like movies again, but it helped give you a bigger imagination of what you could do with all of your tracks. You'd have your train tracks hooked up to your Hot Wheel tracks, and although they didn't fit perfectly, you'd somehow have this car going down and hit the rumble train track and it was just crazy you'd go through our hallway and living room and it was just really neat so I really appreciated just how that helped you growing up with your imagination unlike how highway 35 had so many tie-ins and even its own video game acceleracers never had an official video game tie-in there may have been plans I mean there was this long lost article that was discovered stating this there are also plans for an Acceleracers video game in the future. Now all of these came to fruition, the cards, the show, but this is the only evidence that an Acceleracers game was ever planned. Maybe in the future we'll see something like concept art, I don't know. But there are games out there that have some Acceleracers ties. Hot Wheels beat that, which we'll talk about in a bit, and also Hot Wheels Ultimate Racing for the PSP. Now, I never knew of this game until almost about a year ago, and I never even had a PSP growing up. I had a hand-me-down Game Boy Advance, and later in life, I upgraded to a 3DS. I never did even have a DS as a kid. But this game has a lot of ties to World Race. You could say it was almost planned as an Acceleracers game, and then it was quietly canceled and reworked. But these are all just purely coincidental. 
Basically, the developers, they were given this role to make a Hot Wheels video game, and they were giving nothing else. So they watched the movies, and they used those as inspiration. But not as to try to adapt them. I guess if you do want to be technical, there was an online Flash game, but I never played it. And there was another one on HotWheels.com that I remember, but these are no longer playable currently. But it seems like everything was going smooth here. Incredible die-cast cards, an awesome card game, and five incredible movies. How did this all end? Who are you? What are you trying to hide? Son, we need to talk. Dad? This is one of the coolest twists in children's media. This is an inception. This is just another reason that the show is awesome still to this day. Throughout the series, we see this character who was Vert's father, Jack Wheeler. He goes away constantly because his squadron is always shipping out. So once it's revealed that he actually is this, it comes out of nowhere. But it still makes total sense. Now you're all probably dying to know. What happens next? Well? Wait. Wait, where are you going? Wait! What happens next? Sadly, Hot Wheels Acceleracers was canned. There never was an Acceleracers 5 or a continuation. The story that was left in the ultimate race was never given a proper finish. There was plans, however. Throughout the years, little by little, these scrapped plans have been revealed. There was actually going to be another four more movies planned, along with a new way that the series would evolve. Let's just break this down. Some guy said that he messaged the Acceleracers director on Reddit, just expressing his love of the series. And in response, this is what he got. Yes, that's me. Glad you liked the show. It was a lot of fun to work on. There was a plan for four more movies, but Mattel canceled after the first four. We were going to meet Porkchop's mom, Mama Chop, but that's all I can remember. I'm honestly conflicted about this. Four more movies to finish off a series sounds incredible, but then that little voice whispers in my ear. Horrible, horrible things are going to happen! Listen. I would have loved this as a kid, but now I think I'm good to be honest. The story that I continued in my head that me and my dad would constantly tweak and evolve, I just don't know if it would be satisfying after all of these years, even if it was to be revived. Also, Mama Chop sounds hilarious and great. I love the idea of this, mostly because with Pork Chop's father dying, it would make for an interesting character, and how she dealt with that compared to Pork Chop. I don't know, there can be some interesting stuff there. Or maybe she's the mother figure of all the metal maniacs. I'm just spitballing here, but there's a lot there that could have made a great character. Now further evidence of the movies continuing came about with some leaked toy prototypes. Oh boy. This is what makes me glad it never really continued. Not that this is a terrible idea of how cars would be able to transform and each driver would have weapons. I just don't see Hot Wheels anymore. The toys are cool, but just not my idea of how to properly continue the series. Later on, a lot of these ideas were repurposed for their next show, Battle Force 5. I didn't like this, mostly because I was older and the show was more for children than Acceleracers was. But it was also the concept too. It just wasn't Hot Wheels for me. It deviated way too far from what made me fall in love with the series to begin with. Now, this leads into the point of it being canned. This guy on Reddit also contacted someone who worked during all of when this was going down. And he responded by saying this. Well, glad to meet such a fan of Acceleracers. Yeah, the Redacted was very fun to work on. I was in the middle of that whole project and worked on a lot of the story. 
so I can probably let you know quite a bit. Plus I redacted. But if you want to write anything, please do not use my name on stuff I tell you about because I do still redacted. Really, what happened is the marketing team changed right in the middle of the project, and they felt that it had become more popular than the Hot Wheels brand itself. So they were concerned about it killing Hot Wheels. In my honest opinion, I thought that was crap. They rotated marketing teams so much at Mattel, it killed so many good projects, and it proved to cause us a lot of frustration. But anyways, on the continuing story of Acceleracers, we were exploring the options of transforming cars. Basically, all the stuff we designed and concepted ended up being used in Battle Force 5. I have an original storyboard I did for the evolution of the Acceleracers that spawned the whole idea of transforming cars. It showed a car racing towards a canyon and transforms into a running robot suit that wraps around the driver and jumps the canyon. We even started working with Takara in Japan to help us with the transformation on the cars, the originator of Transformers. I have redacted a few patents at Mattel for the transformation stuff. Then the marketing team shut down Acceleracers. I was assigned to work on Redacted. So about one year later, Mattel had me work on Battle Force 5 because most of the stuff that they were using for that show, I had designed originally for Acceleracers. It was a ton of fun working on all that and some of my best career memories. Honestly, I get what Mattel was saying. What started off as sort of a story just about a car series slowly was evolving into something more than Hot Wheels. And this new series would have proved that. While from a money standpoint, it makes no sense. But from a marketing standpoint, it does. Acceleracers was slowly becoming something bigger and better than Mattel's Hot Wheels franchise. So I can see from a marketing standpoint how it would make sense. So I guess that begs the question now, will Acceleracers ever come back? I've often wondered though, how it would be done. To be honest, I just can't ever see the movies continuing. If they did, that would probably be the biggest slap in the face for me. But I just don't see it happening. There was too long of a break, and it's just not lucrative enough in my opinion. At least, not yet. They need to slowly bring it back, and that's exactly what they're doing, it seems like. Hot Wheels Unleashed is the newest and the best Hot Wheels game that has ever come out. The way it controls and its online track design is amazing. But then, they did it. While not every car is here, the crossover came out of nowhere, blowing the lid off of more possible ways to return. And a few months later, that happened again. I remember this E3. This was a press conference bogged down by boring announcements and hardly anything to show from Xbox side of things. But this was a major highlight for me. I still have yet to play this DLC, but it looked incredibly fun. More and more small crossovers like this are needed. If more and more awareness is brought to the series, maybe Mattel would maybe re-release some of the cars. I wouldn't want this to be a cheap thing though. I would want this to be for collectors. This is adult collectible, not a toy though. Careful. Mark the price up, say 10 or 15 bucks a car. Make them out of a durable material though. Have the paint be super, super detailed. Perhaps maybe even do a one to 25 scale model of them. Subtle ways like this is how I imagine it could come back, if at all. I know when we brought JC on, his way of doing it was to do a comic series to continue the show. Which is not a bad idea, honestly. Like, it's already been almost 20 yeah. years. I, I doubt, you know. I'd say the, the only thing I want, really, 
is to bring it back subtly in a in a comic book fashion. I'd say start it off how it how it started in in World Race. Is just go back to comics, mm. do it small, put it in with the cars, and then see if it catches on again. And if it doesn't, well, you didn't spend a trillion dollars on a movie. You just printed a couple yeah. of papers, and that was it. You know, M maybe even re-release the movies too. Fans 4K'd them, and they had them on YouTube for the longest time. But then Mattel said no. I wasn't upset, mostly because I thought, oh, they're going to do it themselves or give us maybe a five-pack Blu-ray. But it's been a few years now since this happened, and not a word has come from Mattel. There needs to be a new way to watch these. Going to Internet Archive isn't ideal, and the DVDs are kind of expensive now. Mattel, Put them on Netflix or some other streaming service where a whole new generation of kids could see them. And who knows, it might be surprising how popular it could get again. Now, let's talk about the live action movie. Having been in production hell now for nearly 20 years, that's right, this was announced first back in 2003 and has gotten delay after delay after delay. New people coming and going, new writers, new directors, they just got new writers back in January, actually. It's gone from studio to studio, finally landing, though, with Bad Robot Productions and Warner Brothers Pictures. I have no idea where this could possibly go, because you have one guy's hands that could possibly get on it. Uh-oh, J.J. Abrams. While he has produced every single movie except one that was from Bad Robot, the only good one I can say was 10 Cloverfield Lane. The Mission Impossible ones, I don't really count since Tom Cruise always has the final say on those movies, but this just doesn't give me faith in the movie. Now, there's two ways that I've always thought this movie could be about. It could be a live-action adaptation of Highway 35 and Acceleracers. Or it could be just a traditional car movie, like Days of Thunder, Need for Speed, or maybe the first Fast and Furious. I can see them mostly taking the easy way out, though, with a regular car movie. I'm fine with that. I'd like one of my childhood movies to be unscathed from people who think they know better than it. And not just an actor, an entrepreneur, nay, an influencer! He said the thing! He said the thing! My name is Ong. Greetings from Transylvania! <laughs> Honestly, I think if they tried to do a Highway 35 adaptation or an Acceleracers adaptation, they would insert a lot of stupid drama. They would dumb the characters down and turn it more into maybe a Fast and Furious levels of stupidity. The budget I can see being blown way out of the water though. Mostly probably because they would want to cast big names. And you just can't do this. First of all, cast no names. This makes sense from a budgeting standpoint, but also from a character standpoint where they can act and look like the characters even more so. No Dwayne Johnson as Porkchop. The budget needs to be tiny, like 50 million, or even half of that. RRR proved you can do a long, great story with good CGI and sets on a budget of just 66 million. You need to keep the budget down with this movie if you're doing a Highway 35 adaptation. Because to be honest, this is a pretty niche thing. I don't know. I just don't see a good movie coming from this, whether it be an adaptation or not. But I would like to be proven wrong. We'll see. We'll see. But even with everything, with it being canned and forgotten by most, the love for this series still goes strong, down to this day. There are a ton of different ways this show has lived on, mostly due to fans. I remember this fan script for Acceleracers 5, fittingly titled The Finish Line, 
I thought it was all right, just not what I would have done personally with the story. There's also this fan comic that's got some great artwork, especially with the car scenes. When I was reading it, I could easily imagine all the voices in the background music in my head. There's mods for existing video games like Distance that has Acceleracers tracks. There's a fan game called Project Acceleracers, and while it's detailed and I like the fact that there's the ability to switch tires, the gameplay is... Um, let's just say it has a lot of work to go. I cannot control the cars in this game. The first turn that I always take, it just feels way too loose and not arcadey enough, which is exactly how I think that it should be. I can have a lot more fun with something like Unleashed because of the controls themselves. But there's a lot here that's still cool. The implementation of Accela chargers, the cars, the detail of one-to-one -one on the racetracks. Fix the controls and you have an incredible game. There's also this amazing prequel movie that's being made by fans about the Fog Realm. So far about what's been shown, I am ecstatic for it and I cannot wait for it to come out. Please take your time with this. Us as fans, we can wait. When it comes to the more physical side of things, there's this guy who 3D prints and sells physical Accela chargers. They are very, very cool and well detailed. There's a ton of repaints and fan custom car websites. They're mostly here if you don't want to pay the ha. But as for myself, I keep my excitement for this series going still just by stuff that reminds me of it. For instance, I briefly mentioned Hot Wheels Unleashed and how it did this crossover with some Highway 35 and Acceleracers vehicles. I try to hop in for a few races once a month just to scratch that itch I get. And like I said, the gameplay is a lot of fun. A game though that I constantly played and was my game of the year in 2018 was an arcade racer called Onrush. I loved this. This was everything that Hot Wheels was to me. Crazy tracks and cool cars. On top of it, it had tight controls and a great online community. I sunk hours into this game and I was still playing it well into 2021. But sadly, it just kind of slowly died off. It still has a really good single player, so if you can pick it up, I highly recommend it. On the movie side of things, there was three movies that was everything I ever wanted. The first one is obvious, Speed Racer. This came at the most perfect time in my life. It was too perfect. As I collected Hot Wheels more and more and discovered Highway 35 and Acceleracers, Speed Racer was gearing up for release around the same time. Now, growing up, I never had cable or the internet. So I didn't discover it through that method. More so, the toys. Go Speed Racer! It's the Casa Crystal 5000 multi-size cage track set with dangerous frozen curves. Rip the ice slip, race ahead, and leave the competition in the cold. Yeah! Track set with one car, you put it together, batteries not included, other cars sold separately. There was this crossover that Hot Wheels did with Speed Racer. I collected every single one of these cars, along with almost every single piece of merchandise that I could get my hands on for this. I never really knew about the anime or the movie that was coming. I thought Speed Racer was just another thing that was a part of Hot Wheels. And while I don't recall how I discovered the movie, maybe I saw a trailer for it somewhere in another movie, or maybe there was a promo in one of the toy packaging, but seeing Speed Racer in the theater, it was everything that I wanted in a movie. And it easily became my favorite movie of all time. Speed Racer was a lot like Acceleracers. So my love for Hot Wheels fed into a greater appreciation for Speed Racer. It wasn't until years after the movie that I discovered the anime, the manga, and the comic books. I remember that I bought this Metal Matchbox 5 limited edition. If you want to hear more about my thoughts on that movie, that was my first video that I ever did. Go check that out. The second movie that kept my appreciation up came a few years later. Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One. This was interesting. I remember the buildup for this because my dad actually read the book first and wouldn't stop recommending it to me. 
He was telling me all sorts of crazy stuff, like how Kiryu Mechagodzilla fights Ultraman. There's X-Wings, there's TIE Fighters, there's the Millennium Falcon. The main character plays a part in War Games, the movie. And then that dude battles a wizard in a game of Joust. This was just right up my alley. The book was incredible. And with the movie announced a year later, by none other than Steven Spielberg himself directing, this was a recipe for an amazing movie. I couldn't have been more excited. But then the movie came out. In total, it was good. But if you read the book, eh. It's just not that incredible of a story as the book is. But that's probably a video for another time. What I'm here to talk about, though, is the race. Regardless of what you think of the movie, the race is one of the coolest sequences I have ever seen in the theater. I would put it up there with the fight at the end of Avengers Endgame and the Speed Racers ending. Everything in this race had my jaw to the floor. So much of this race reminded me of that little kid playing with his Hot Wheels. There was also all the different cameos from different cars. The A-Team van, the Batmobile, the Akira bike, and the F1 car from Pole Position. Every single second of this race still gets me excited, and it gets crazier and crazier. I mean, one minute all the cars are crashing into each other with chainsaw, buzz thaws, then all of a sudden the train comes and it blows up, there's a big truck with the gas thing, giant ramps that are ramming and blowing explosions, and there's a T-Rex, there's King Kong, there's these big boulders that go and knock the cars out of the way, and there's explosions. I just love this race because it's what Hot Wheels was to me growing up. Crazy over-the-top tracks and cool cars. I cannot praise this scene enough. The last movie, though, to really remind me about my love of Hot Wheels was Ford v. Ferrari. You ready? I was born ready, Mr. Shelby. Hit it. Holy moly, I cannot recommend this movie enough. The story, the characters, the music, the editing, and the sound are a 10 out of 10. But the racing scenes are ecstatically fun. Unlike with Ready Player One or Speed Racer, this is 100% grounded in reality, but it's still just as exciting. The sound of the car's engines to the swooping cinematography and the tense feeling throughout the races, it never gets old to me. This just reminds me of that feeling that I felt watching Highway 35 as a kid. They made everything cool. All three of these movies did just like Acceleracers and Highway 35. I honestly owe a lot to this series, just how it formed my love of movies and video games. Without it, who knows, I might not have liked Speed Race or have gotten into video games. We never know. I honestly could go on and on about this series for hours. Dude, we're too late. Let's fight and help it. Let's see if he really deserves it. Hello? Boss, he's at it again. The guy who likes She-Hulk? Mm-hmm. The very one. Alright, bring him back. Well, time to go dig up my shovel. <laughs>